So first out, Dr. Professor Per Aufset, <laughs> Chief Technical Officer and co-founder of Dig Science. Very exciting. You also have 10 years of being an adjunct professor at NTNU, Restward Geophysics. Thank you so much for pushing the boundaries of geophysical geocomputing. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, welcome back from your coffee break. Uh, just uh, briefly f uh, from the beginning, so Dig Science is a very new company. We started in February, and we are the res direct result of the oil crisis. We're a leftover exploration team from Tello that pulled out of Norway, and uh, we decided, hey, let's jump on a digital bandwagon. <laughs> and uh, then we are hooking up with some uh, other cool people around, and there are people coming all the way from Japan here who we're working with from Atelica. Uh, Tapan Mukri is another one who's now an advisor for our company. So the title uh, of the talk that uh, uh, I'm going to give on behalf of uh, me, and i also showing some examples that Tapan has sent me, Seismic Facious Classification Away from Well Control, the role of augmented training data using Bayesian modeling to improve machine learning methods and exploration. Okay, so as I said, we are an exploration team and we work with uh, risking. And uh, traditionally, we've been working very much in silos. Okay, so Bayesian model works with a source rock uh, migration and, and uh, rest of our uh, geologists work on the sedimentology and stratigraphy and uh, also the interpreter works on the trap, and I do some AVO at the end and see if my maps match with their maps. Okay, and then we come up, do some risking and try to predict uh, if there is a discovery. The new model is, uh, or what we want to do now is to, to hook up with uh, people who are very good at machine learning and, and then try to integrate, use that as a tool to integrate more uh, our uh, fields and, and do this sort of together, jointly, and, and uh, whether it's in a Bayesian setting or, or with other machine learning algorithms, to do it faster and with better decisions. So that's sort of the setting the stage. Uh, the problem that I will focus on today is actually the fact that we have been drilling a lot of the structures in uh, offshore Norway. Now we're heading for more of the stratigraphic tracks off the cliffs. Uh, so one of the big problems we're facing is that we, when we, we often hear the, the word big data, but actually we're facing sparse data. We don't have much data. We have, well, we have a lot of well data, but they're located on the structures. But we're going to look for things away from the structures where we don't have wells or so we have very few wells. Okay, so we need to do some modeling and find some scenarios for how it could be. And who can tell you something about how is it's out there? What is a geologist? So if you can couple the competence of a geologist and a basin modeler with a geophysicist and machine learning, we can create, for example, a lot of saddle wells, as we also did in the hackathon. We had a very a nice example of that. And then we can try to say something and do the prediction. Uh, OK, so. Uh, uh, the workflow in QSI, or quantitative seismic interpretation, we've actually been working quite a lot with machine learning. I would never called it that, but uh, we combined well log information, looking at data, creating what we call probability density functions, using that as training data in a Bayesian setting, for example, and then taking the seismic data, often inverting them into impedances, and then coupling that and, and, and creating leaderfacious maps and, and also adding or mapping the uncertainties of that. But in that setting, we often use these data on the structures and uh, maybe did a little bit modeling, but we didn't really pull in the Bayesian modeler or the sequence stratigrapher and try to, to see how, how we can uh, improve on this when we're moving away from well control. And that's where I, I'm, I'm talking about here, augmented trading data. How can we change these? So not use stationary training data at one place, but actually make them change as you move down the basin. Your machine learning algorithm needs to take that into account. Update your training data in consistency with how your geology is changing. OK, so I'll give you two examples. And of course, this is work in, 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 in progress. And so some of it is uh, I'll show some results that I've already done before, but also a little bit uh, the way forward. 
so this is a, uh, an example from the Loppehai and the Barency. And just to, to begin, once upon a time here, actually I was working with the, in Hydro together with Harald Flesch uh, and Art Jan van Weingarten many years ago, and we had this CLARA, Classification of Rock Physics and AVO Modeling. So that was 2002, maybe a little bit too early, but we got uh, a quite nice result, and this was published in, in Leading Edge. And we used this technology in uh, offshore Angola, looking for, for hydrocarbons, and, and the idea was to couple rock physics depth trends the compaction of, of rocks as a function of depth, and then create training data of AVO distributions, intercept and gradient. And these are attributes you can derive from the seismic, from the amplitudes, intercept and gradient. And after a calibration step, you can do a training and then predict the most likely. And in this case, we used a, a linear discriminant method that was presented earlier today, like a Malanovic distance. Uh, Okay, so uh, this was good, but there's a lot of things we can do with this to make it better, uh, especially in more complex spaces. This works well when you have an unconsolidated sand, only mechanical compaction, no uplift, no diagenesis. So we need to dig deeper. We need to extend the technology by adding more GNG domains. Uh, diagenesis needs to be included, tectonics, especially in the barren sea and also on our sequence stratigraphic principles. I'll focus mostly on the first two in this talk, but of course we're working on uh, all those here. Uh, okay, so just briefly, this, uh, this is, uh, came out in a paper in the Leading Edge a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, what we're doing here is actually coupling the burial history. So this is your, your rock. It actually, the rock you see today was deposited maybe 250 million years ago, let's say that, at the surface. It's been going way down, and the properties of the rock change as a function of the burial. So what you measure today is actually a result of this whole history. So if we know this history, we can say something or predict the properties based on knowing the, the burial history. And the basin modeler and the geologist, they have a good understanding of that, those curves. So by coupling that, and Valderag is working with Equinor still, I think, he came up with some very good uh, models for modeling diagenesis, so we can actually predict uh, quartz sedimentation as a function of this geological history, both during uh, burial and uplift. So these are parameters that we can plug into our rock physics models. And to do that, we can actually predict the seismic properties as a function of the burial history. And then, having done that, we can actually uh, predict the expected AVO result at a given uh, depth or a, for a given burial history. And this we can do, do thousand times. You can simulate this burial history and create Saudu burials or, or testing for different scenarios and create training data in this space. And this is what I'm doing. So this is just showing in a, a very uh, 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 synthetic example. So I just made a very simple burial curve here. It's, we have this, what we call the frying pan. We know that it's around 70 degrees. You start to cement the quartz rich sands becoming sandstones, so you lithify the rock. But in the case where here, you actually started to lift up before you even reached into the frying pan. So the rocks are loose, and the AVO response is a class three. And here's the Monte Carlo simulation for different, when you put some uncertainties around those curves. If you put it deeper and cement, you see that the AVO response completely changed, to class one or two, two P. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna do. And this is Yuxa data set, it's, uh, or uh, Skull and Yuxa. You have a discovery here, a gas discovery, and Yuxa is a non-commercial oil discovery. And this, you see the structures, they're very complex. I had a student some years ago who created some uplift maps, uh, Nura Johansson, so we are, and these are derived from seismic velocities, not from the amplitudes, but the velocities, so the independent information about the uplift history. So we have information along this line about, above the, about the uplift, which also means that we have information about the maximum burial. Okay, so we can see here, and we actually look at the reservoir in the well, the Yuxa sand. Turns out that it has been, based on this observation, it, even though it has lower uplift, because it's deeper today, it's actually been, sp been sp spending more time in the frying pan. So it's cooked more and it's stiffer, and it's have higher velocities, even the porosities are higher, probably because it's a cleaner phase shift. So, Yuxa is slightly more cemented than Skalle. Okay, now we run this program that is kind of the same method as Clara, but we're, uh, 
we're taking into account uh, the, the cement volume. So we're adding cement, this burial history link, in this, uh, this Clara approach. And here's just uh, showing the, sort of the, the, the priors for the, uh, for the uh, brine case sand, uh, shaley sand and shale. And then you also have the covariances. So we assume Gaussian distributions. And then you create this training data for different facies. Shales, background shales and brine sands. Red is oil here and yellow is gas. And then you, uh, you do a, a, a variance match. Uh, and then you, we do a Mahalanovis distance classification in this case. And then you see that we predict the gas here and the, uh, also gas in the Brent level. Uh, light blue is uh, brine sands. And in the yuxa here, it's actually predicting brine sand. But we know it's oil. But it's 40, 50% oil saturation. So maybe that's why we're predicting brine sand. But remember, it's more cemented. It's a different sand over here. I've been using the properties of Kolmüller reservoir over here with a different burial history than that one. So I shouldn't use the same training data. I should use something else. And by the way, this is just a QC plot showing that where it's white here, it means that you have a, a good prediction or a short distance. And and yellow is uh, longer distances, plotted at minus uh, log of the distance. Uh, OK, so I'm updating. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm repeating the exercise for the yuxa. So I actually get slightly stiffer sand, slightly higher values. Training data are shifting. So I'm getting different AVO training data. And then I do the exercise again. Looks a little bit more different here, of course, but it's still gas. But uh -huh. I'm starting to pick up some information that there is oil over here in the yuxa. OK, and if I put on, actually did a test on the well log data where I actually used estimated intercept and gradient, assuming a shale background trend, local background trend here, and did the same classification on the well log data itself. And you see that we actually, we have, uh, we, we are picking up that, expecting to pick, that, pick up that information, uh, at least at the well log scale, but we're picking it up also at the seismic scale there. OK, so, um, uh, and then I'm taking this a bit further because now I just tested, okay, kind of a blind test. Remember, I didn't use the well of data. I just used the burial trends and the depth trends. So, of course, you can calibrate and, and fine-tune at one well and test. In this, case, uh, in, the, in this case, of course, I had the answer, so I knew it. But this is something you could do for a prospect. And it, uh, hopefully, it should, uh, should uh, give you, uh, give you uh, better results than, than uh, not putting into the account this burial history. But of course, you can do uh, play around with uh, with um, with these burial histories because, of course, there's uncertainties in, in the uplift. Maybe also in the maximum burial. Of, uh, here, I just tested with the uplift. So if you do that, because that was you remember from the uplift map, I have different uplifts along that line. So I can make that my third dimension in this training data. So I have intercept, gradient, and uplift. And that's pretty much if you have stationary PDFs with this no up or the same uplift. These are my data and these are my training data ellipses. So these are just different lith lithologies and fluids. You see, so yeah, in this case, actually, the gas is red in this curve and this is green. So it's, it's different from the other one. But, uh, but uh, G, yeah, G is gas and oil is green. Yeah. So this is stationary. Make it non-stationary. So now you see this. This uh, increasing maximum burial here, so or, or actually this should be increase, uh, varying uh, uplift, longer time in there, so that's more correctly, it should be m more time in the cementation window. It probably would also show this trend if you put it uh, increasing maximum burial. Okay, so, uh, and then uh, the prediction in this case, you're testing, this is stationary, uh, showing for Scala, now it's separated the fluids, gas, oil, and brine, blue, green, red in this case. And then here is uh, lithology, cemented sand, uh, sand in uh, greenish or olive, uh, unconsolidated sand in yellow, and shale in green. And if you do the non-stationary, you see that you get some interesting uh, differences. They're subtle, but these subtleties, because oil and water, there are so there are so small differences. So these subtleties can be very important. Okay, so uh, move on to case example two. So. Uh, this is actually a paper coming out right now in geophysics, uh, where Tapan Mekri uh, is the co-author. And it's the same way of thinking, integrating statistical raw physics and, and, and pressure and thermal history modeling to map reservoir lead patients in deep water Gulf of Mexico. It's the title of the paper. And the idea is here to bring it even closer to the basin modeler. 
So here we integrate uh, information from uh, geological input and you can couple a lot of the equations and you predict rock properties. Uh, uh, the case I'm going to show you is from Gulf of Mexico. So pressure history and temperature history can be very complex due to this uh, uh, salt uh, dye pairs. So in this case, what they did, they have two wells here, well B and A, and one going close to the salt wall here, and one just outside the, uh, the, the, uh, the salt uh, canvas or, or, or uh, this uh, dike. And uh, yeah, uh, the reference case is actually using the actual data in your prediction for both wells. The scenario one, you just use well B to, to generate your PDF for your training data. And scenario two, you add on the basic modeling link. Okay, so those are the two. So this is kind of the truth, the, the, the process. And then you have the simple, kind of what I did with only Scala, and then adding the, the, the um, lateral change in geology. Okay, uh, inversion cubes over here, impedance and EPVS, I think. It's kind of 3D, so it's different to see, but it's kind of a structure here. Uh, so, uh, and for the well A and B, you see these are the pressure curves, also the thermal history will be different. So, because of the presence of salt, you will have comp different pressures act in these reservoirs, but uh, probably also over pressure in, in, in one of those. Uh, I'm not going into technical details of the case, I'm just demonstrating the workflow here. Uh, but what you see again is that this training data for both here, uh, shale and sandstones, are changing, and in this case they're doing a Bayesian classification of the inversion data using these PDFs, and then for the ref this is a reference case where you, you, you use both the wells. Scenario one was only one, and here with the basin, basin uh, modeling uh, coupled to, to the uh, rock physics to create your, your non-stationary PDFs. And here's just some results showing that you got much better prediction of the sand thicknesses, uh, with scenario two versus scenario one, but also here you see uh, in one, uh, if, for example, uh, for a test, there's a validation well, a separate well here, you're also testing this workflow where you actually, it's actually a question whether you predict sand or not. So it's quite interesting. Anyway, uh, I think I'll just gonna summarize. So uh, domain knowledge is important, and I think that's also a valid business model, and that's why we we decided to start this. Uh, Cinematology, we have the competence in all these uh, areas and uh, we want to link up with uh, smart people on uh, machine learning. So, uh, to, so it's exciting times with that. And then, of course, there are many sources of uncertainty. So the geology, of course, the scenarios, the heterogeneity, imperfect data, approximate rock physics model. We need more uh, multiple scenarios. Uh, certainty, quantification, and also remember we're looking for rare events, and I think it was mentioned earlier, it's always difficult to, how do you classify or train for something that is very rare? It's, it's of course, it's challenging. Uh, machine learning is not a black box, or it, it's, uh, we need the domain experts. Um, we see a phase transition now in massive computations and machine learning, and that's an opportunity, and we need to take advantage of this tr transition. So if you can meet the challenges, avoid the pitfalls, you can benefit from the opportunities. So with that, just dig it. <laughs> and, and, and finally, uh, thanks to Dig Science colleagues. Chris and Dari is here as well, and Tura Hansen is here. Chris and Angar is uh, in Oslo, and Karin uh, Sayer and Gaida Miller. Ivan Lehoski has been helping me with some of the codes. The key contributions, uh, Lundin, uh, we worked on a publication on this and they get no pick for the seismic data. So with that, uh, I'm open for uh, questions. Thank you. No questions? <laughs> Everything was crisp clear, huh? Uh, uh, I know. Uh, I just a question about you know because when you try to model the kind of ABO response based on the kind of um, geological history through time and, and I think one of the challenges, of course, is to what degree are you able to predict, for instance, the temperature gradient in a new area or a new host or whatever. 
So in this first example, for instance, how much was that used in the kind of evaluation of the geological history? You know, what actually temperature gradient do you have? Were you using the weather result, or is it based on other measurement? You know, because it, I suppose the temperature gradient is a key thing here to try and... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a good point. Temperature <coughs> gradient is an uncertainty. We have information from wells, but they're usually <coughs> not very rel reliable. They can vary a lot. And temperature, especially in the Barents Sea with different structure and uplift history, it can vary locally a lot as well. But that's one of the things where you can actually go in and, and put it into the workflow and play with those, that as a, a part of a, in a Bayesian workflow. So I, uh, I showed you the sort of Malanabis distance didn't really go into understanding these uncertainties, but that's the, the step forward. So it's a very, very valid point. Uh, but in that scholar, I think we, you, they, they know the rest where you have actually, so we have good control on the temperature in, in that area. It's a, it's a discovery, so yeah. Thanks. Yes.